I think a lot of it has to do with uh, geometry. I think that Spanish announce table is positioned in an area that uh, a lot of trajectory and a lot of falls happen to take place in that one key area. Now it looks like we're on a set of twister. Now we are famous or infamous, infamous for this. I don't like being famous because we almost get killed here. Right now in this week's Superstars exclusive, we take an up close and personal look at Paul White. Michael Cole has the story of how the big show got so big. Look at the size of the big show. Yes, it's a big, big show tonight. It's show time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's the big show. Man, he is a, he's a phenomenon. Come on, crank it up. This is how we're used to seeing the big show. Popular and famous, everyone wants a piece of Paul White. But there was a time when the big show wasn't living large. Tell us what it was like uh, for a kid your size growing up. Uh, it was different. I mean, of course, you know, when you're different as a kid, especially being really big, uh, you're automatically not cool when you don't fit in. You know, when you're a kid, anything different is uh, weird. Born a normal-sized baby, Paul started growing at four months and seemingly never stopped. In kindergarten, he was nearly five feet tall, reaching seven feet by high school. But all throughout childhood, kids tried to chop him down to size. Did uh, a lot of the kids make fun of you growing up? Yeah, uh, you got the different nicknames. There's treetop, there was, you know, my dad was really strict, so I had really short hair. So you got a lot of, and you know, back in the 80s when I was growing up, everybody had members only jackets and feathered hair, and you know, I had whatever I got handed down and a flat top, so I wasn't very cool. Now obviously you could uh, take care of yourself uh, because of your size, but would you, were you ever a bully? Never a bully. I, uh, it's only in the sports entertainment industry that I'm somewhat of a bully. Uh, I was uh, the type of kid that was really quiet. Paul finally started making noise when he took up sports. A high school hoop star, the big show was big time. Sports was a good thing for me because all of a sudden, instead of being like the, uh, the, the, the dreaded giant kid, instead I was just, uh, I was somebody that everybody was glad to have on their team. A short white though with the tip and then the putback. The big show did play a year of division one ball at Wichita State but rarely got into games. You, to put it bluntly, did not have a stellar career <laughs> at Wichita State, did you? <laughs> well, let's just say that, uh, um, OK, I suck. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate <laughs> it. OK, so I got no vertical leap, no outside jump shot, and I'm slow. Thank you. The big show hit the showrooms after college, briefly taking a job as a car salesman. Just like Banner White. Paul, we're here at this Ford dealership, and I mean, this place has got to bring back a lot of memories for you. You know it does, Mike. I used to call myself Tall Paul. Tall Paul. Of all things. Had it on my little business card, and uh, used to sell cars like Mustangs and Explorers and things like that. How would Tall Paul come up to the customer and try to sell a car? I'd warm up with a smile, you know, and, and try to humor him. I said, well, you know, if you want to look underneath the car, I can pick it up for you so you can walk under and check out the undercarriage and the belly and make sure there's no rust or anything else. So you would actually lift the car up? No, I'd tell him I would not. <laughs> just stay a little bit within, you know, reason here. So I'm just looking around, and I want you to sell me one of these cars. You see this car here? You don't want this car. Why? Because this car looks too good for you. We say the convertible. You see the convertible here? You see this price right here? That price right there is a firm price. Well, no, I don't want to pay that price. You're going to pay that price. You don't buy this car, I'm gonna bash your head in the hood, and you're gonna wear this car out of this no lot. You understand way. me? No, no, no. I got kids to feed. I got shoes to put on my baby's feet. Well, since you can tell his shtick really didn't work, the big show got a flat tire selling cars. I figured I had to find a new trade because, you know, I liked eating and I wasn't eating anymore. In fact, Paul was so poor after college, he once had to concoct a sandwich only a dentist could love. Two slices of bread like I have, okay? A little bit of toothpaste. Oh, please. Actually, I probably didn't even have that much toothpaste, probably, because I was about out of toothpaste, too. So you could eat and freshen your breath at the same time. That's absolutely the grossest thing I've ever heard. Well, you know what the thing was I was thinking in my mind was that, you know, it was minty, <laughs> and it might actually taste like a minty sandwich. Oh, good God, that is disgusting. Toast. Toast. Sports entertainment. Please. Actually, you know, 
That's not bad. It's <laughs> not that bad. I'm exactly. These days, Paul White is pasting most of his opponents. But the big show always remembers he was nearly canceled before becoming a hit. Being different's not bad. You know, we're all different, you know. A long time I thought I was a freak because I was so big, you know. But you know what? Me being a freak has allowed me to entertain a lot of people, allowed me to provide a great future for my family, and allowed me to have a lot of fun. And over the edge next Sunday, there will be no allowances when Ken Shamrock and the Union meet the Acolytes, Viscera, and the Big Boss Man in an eight-man tag war. Remember, each man from the opposing team of four must be eliminated to win this grueling contest. And in a precursor to Over the Edge, the Union will be in action in an eight-man tag tonight on Heat. The hottest show on Sunday nights blazes your way at 7, 6 Central, right here on USA. Next week on WWF Superstars. Yeah, they made me talk a little trash about you. You know, I don't want any part of third base, I promise. <laughs> the big show hits the big leagues. Fried chicken before you do chicken. anything. See, I eat fried chicken before I wrestle. I've never seen a big guy like that get up so high. But I can fly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like Michael Jordan. For me, it was just a chance, you know, to do something exciting. I've always wanted to throw the first pitch, and I, there's no way in hell I'll ever be elected president to get to do it, so this is a good spot. That's next week, only here on WWF Superstars. The Big Show puts on another show this week, destroying one and all who come his way. Oh, boy, look out. That is a showstopper. Certainly, it looks like the Big Show is in a league of his own, but not when the Big Show hits the big leagues. They call the major leagues the big show. So what better place for Paul White to hang recently than at a Tampa Bay Devil Rays game? Hey, man. How are you? Doing? Good. How are you? What's going on? A lot of the guys that come up to me and, and at the uh, game were uh, wrestling fans. What's up, baby? How are you gentlemen doing? Good. Good, Bobby man. Witt, man. Huh? Bobby Witt. How are you? Nice to meet you, Bobby. Paul White, you're back. For me, it was taking it back a little bit because I'm fans of these guys. So it was kind of like uh, one hand washes the other. It was good. I could see you playing the hot corner. You think now? Woo! A little too slow. A little close. A little too slow. That's your gimmick. They're no different than a lot of guys in our industry. You know, they, they like to do a lot of practical jokes and like to do a lot of, you know, razzing and stuff. 500 pounds of abs. How spooky is that? <laughs> now you got my money, huh? I'll tell you, you owe me some money, huh? Because that's about all I can do with this is beat somebody up. It's like a pea shooter in his hand, doesn't it? Toothpick. Wow. It is a toothpick. You grow up and you watch these guys play baseball and your fans are there. So at the same time, these guys now with their families are watching you, you know, do your thing. So it's like a, there's a mutual respect there. It, it's a little bit awkward, but nice. How are you guys doing? Good, man. I'm good. How you doing? Good, man. I'm like WWF. I like a lot, but yeah, it's right. good to me, yeah. Hey, you never think that Jose Consenco would be a fan of mine or, or know some of the things that I do. See? Uh, see, that's my ritual, Don't too. Don't touch me. I'm suing. That's, that's the gimmick. Fried <laughs> chicken before you do chicken. anything. Just to have that kind of a rapport and uh, appreciation, sincere appreciation, was, was really nice. <laughs> Of course, the big show steals the show while there, with fans flocking for autographs. Well, this is the first time I ever saw a baseball, Billy. The big show lives in the Tampa area, making Paul even bigger among these fans. Being my hometown, being people to see me around, I think it would be a good reaction. It should be a positive one. Oh, my God! Tampa Bay is kind of a town that loves its athletes, and you know, wrestling, of course, and sports entertainment is a is a very popular thing among Tampa Bay fans. What I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to go out and throw out the first pitch. For me, it was just a chance, you know, to do something exciting. I've always wanted to throw out a first pitch, and I, there's no way in hell I'll ever be elected president to get to do it. So this is a good spot. It was funny they got me throwing out this pitch. I was on a ball since I was 13 years old. Don't bounce it. Uh, well, that, you, guys are going, you guys are going to rip me to death. I know it's coming. There's a lot of tension, a lot of anxiety. I mean, you know, there's, these are people that I see in the grocery store and, and video store and stuff, you know, every other day when I'm home. So for me to go out there and throw a wild pitch that goes 10 feet over the, the uh, catcher's head, um, you know, I'd probably have to move to another state. I don't like too hard when I throw that first pitch. Okay. I haven't thought about since I was 13. You know, that's one of those kind of things that when you're a kid watching baseball on TV, and you see somebody throw out the first pitch, you're like, oh, man, I wish I could do that. And then when it's your turn to do it, and somehow you wind up in a lucky spot, you think, 
God, I don't know. What if I screw up? Yeah. I'm trying to find a place to hide to go forward. Thank you, Thank you, man. People are going to be laughing at you. Come up in the tunnel. We we'll laughed too hard. Come on, Ladies and gentlemen, the big show. I had plan B handled. If I threw the pitch over his head, I was just going to run and tackle. Give me a high five. Say a prayer. <sighs> There's the lineup by the big show. But perhaps a friendly face behind the plate helps the big shell throw a perfect strike. I probably got in there about, you know, 140, 150 miles an hour. I didn't put that much on it. Hey, I'm just really happy I got it across the plate. You know, I, I threw it. I didn't throw it as hard as I could. I don't think anybody wanted to see me go out there and try to be all her size. I just went out there and cut across the plate and got there, and I was happy. So even though the big shell won't be called up to the majors anytime soon, this opportunity is still nothing to balk at. Oh, it's very exciting. I mean, for me, it was a, it was a it was a rush. The anxiety of throwing out a first pitch, you know, the the, the crowd response, and and uh, you know, a major league game. You know, I've done something that a lot of people can say that they've done. It's for me, it's a little chapter in the favorite memory book. Are the Undertaker and the Big Show on the same page? Well, just listen. At Unforgiven, there's going to be one outcome, and that outcome is. The Undertaker, once again, will be the World Wrestling Federation champion. Correct? And there's nothing you, you, or anybody else can do about it. It's a fact. Learn to live with it. Let's no go. doubt who's in charge of that group. The beat that will not be denied. Today I get to play the role of a pizza delivery guy. They're still looking at me like, oh my God, who brought in the shade Sasquatch? That's not a pizza guy, that's Godzilla. But this is not a monster part for the big show, just a cameo. The show stars lock him in an elevator to try to scam a free pizza, only to discover this is no ordinary delivery boy. That's 31 minutes, pizza boy. Ooh, hello. Uh, Mr. Pizza Man. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry I'm late. I, I think there's something wrong with your elevator. I'm not the... Uh big quiet serial killer that sometimes you get typecast as you know so this is a situation for me to expand and broad listen you know i, I got kind of hungry late now i got stuck and uh well, i had a couple slices of your pizza awesome yeah, yeah that's hey, great you know we love that we'll share that yeah we'll we share, share that it's fine let's go man we can... it's a uh, energetic it's a uh, funny it's a comedy yeah since 1150. Uh, i'm a little short that could be a huge problem. You know, I was younger growing up, you know, especially in college and things, you know, you always try to figure out shortcuts to saving money, you know, you know, order the pizza to somebody else's house and nobody's home, and then you just happen to be out in the yard and instead of paying 20 bucks for a pizza, you're going to got five bucks for his trouble. You know, you did it just last week. The Big Show takes us behind the scenes at the new show. No food for the Big Show. Right now, I'm studying my lines. These are the wonderful girls that do the incredible job of trying to make me look good. Let me guess, this is Pinhead. <laughs> yes, I look fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> I feel like Dana White. My mother, if she saw a sink like this, she'd kill me. There's three guys here. That'll work. There's one bed. I read the whole thing front and back when I read the script, and it gives me a kind of an idea of what's going on in the scene. Try to develop your own insights on the character. And then when you get on the set, you find out that you're absolutely wrong. <laughs> the director goes, what are you thinking, you big idiot? Well, that's not a problem when the big show tapes a promo with Vern Troyer, alias Mini-Me, from this summer's Austin Powers sequel. Action. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,003. I've had about enough of you. Okay, it's going time, Tom. Come on, Charles. Oh, 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 o
what little bit I've read and seen so far, you know, this is going to be a really cool, happening hip show. So for me to get a little part in it, I'm excited about it. Still $4 short. How about a blender? Does it work? Right now, you know, we're just putting in the groundwork, trying to, to learn this entire industry as fast as I can, and hopefully uh, do something larger in the future. So you give me the tapes, the beans, we'll call it even. You know, maybe a romantic weed. I mean, come on, I look like Mel Gibson, don't you think? Yeah, whatever you say, Big Show. Anyway, don't miss The Big Show on the new comedy, Shasta McNasty, this Tuesday night. Check your local listings for time and channel. We're shooting a pay-per-view commercial for a big event in December called Armageddon. Well, basically what you have is it's kind of a post-apocalyptic set uh, with all of the things torn down, all of the dirt, the grime, the broken down furniture, the broken down machinery, which is kind of symbolizing the WWF before Chris Jericho arrived. I think if you're talking about Armageddon, this says it all. We chose this location because it looks very post-apocalyptic. It's just deteriorated. Who would ever want to be here? Who would want to live here? I'm not digging the location too much. I mean, you know, there's like rats in here bigger than the big show, I guess, walking around. Action! Background two! Background three! This is about the third or fourth commercial that The Rock has been in. And of course, anytime you're on a set with Dave Sahadi, the end product is always worthwhile. Did the flames make The Rock nervous? No, of course not. The Rock emits electricity. He, he emits fire. And it's like a movie set out here, and um, it's just really something really cool that I think that, you know, we'll be happy that we were in for time to come. It's not every day you get to go to an abandoned warehouse and just blow it up and get to stand around in it while it's happening. I love being in an environment like this with our superstars because we're taking them out of the ring, out of the arena, and putting them in these totally unique, totally obscure, incredible environments, and yet their personality still shone through it. Hold on, where's my hairstylist? I need a hairstylist. We're taking them out of the ring and putting them in an environment like this, and they really feel like superstars. They feel, you know, like incredible stars of the silver screen. Mr. Jericho, would you like a water or something? I know that's right, Mr. Zahadi. Just make sure you go back and do the direction uh, yes, exercises sir. I taught Hello, you. Sir. Okay. Get back there. Thank you, sir. Don't interrupt me when I'm on screen, okay? All right, sir. All right. Kids, you know how they are these days. You know, when we tell a story, when we say it's Armageddon, we deliver it in a way that makes you think, you know what? That's going to be pretty crazy and exciting. I want to tune into that. When we are done with the post-production of this commercial, it's just going to blow a lot of people away. It's going to look like the hottest action-adventure, surreal sci-fi movie of the year. It's a cut!